So the topic for this panel uh, is query languages. Um, uh, and I'm going to start it out by, I'm going to put on the hat of the developer. Uh, I would like to write software, and I'd like my software to run everywhere. Um, I don't want to write five different versions of software for five different um, databases. Um, I have uh, complex things I'd like to do in my software. Uh, I'd like to manage documents. I'd like to manage graphs. Uh, I'd like to have it be performant. Uh, I'd like it to run on clusters and be reliable. Uh, I'd like it to use the indexes and all those complicated things that I have uh, built. Um, and I'm kind of upset right now in the NoSQL space because we don't have common query languages yet. Now, so what I'm doing is I'm just writing all my code for relational databases, and I'm just staying here, and I'm going to stay out of the NoSQL space until a panel of experts tells me there's hope in the future that we'll be able to do some, maybe not one query language for everything, but maybe a fewer query languages. So with that, uh, I'd like each of the speakers just uh, introduce themselves, tell us where you're from, and uh, tell us uh, any background or any interest that you have in query languages. Jim, would you like to start? Hello, folks. Uh, I'm Jim. I'm Chief Scientist at Neotech, and uh, I'm a fan of the query language cipher for graph databases. It's going to be a short panel if we all just... <laughs> I haven't got more. I right. one thing, right? I thought, what your bucket list of wishes? There you go. I, I noticed the absence of unicorn. Right. Yeah, so, um, so I'm Leon Gazander. Um, I was part of the Codesil uh, database task group standards forming thing for the network databases in 1972. I had a feeble attempt at uh, trying to change SQL2 into SQL3 with objects, with IBM and Oracle, and wow. on that one. Wow. Uh, I was part of the definition of OQL for the object uh, data. Oh, you were? Wow, group. that's a long time ago. Yeah. Um, I skipped XML because <laughs> I was bored at the time. <laughs> and um, I'm really, really, really wanting to get a graph query language out there. And if we can do it via a NoSQL language, I'll be very happy, but I doubt it. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. But I have to say, uh, Dan, you know, you're what I call a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So two two people and I'm not looking good here. So, <laughs> so my name is my name is Matthias. Uh, I'm from 20 milliseconds. I've been in a query language uh, space also for quite some time. I've been a member of the W3C X Query Working Group, and I, I've learned about standards and how they they are being developed. Uh, it's tough, but I, I, in the long run, of course, it's probably worth it. So I'm not sure what um, what to answer to then. But I, I, I see the NoSQL community here. And I see that the NoSQL community, and if I go into the exhibition, I see all those great data stores. And I'm, I'm not talking about craft databases. Well, we're but, not great data stores. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, not, that's not tremendously kind of you, I have to say. But everybody here, and I'm pretty sure you all agree with me, uh, we have solved the horizontal scalability problem with those data stores. And that's what NoSQL is great at. But if you look at how people are developing applications today with those NoSQL data stores, I think it's a nightmare. I was talking to a lot of data scientists uh, today that work with uh, NoSQL data stores or document stores like MongoDB. And what their job is really hard. They have to write, based on the query languages that exist today, re really tough queries. And each of them is writing, for each query that they do, 400 lines of Python code. And then they're having the next problem, and they're writing another 400 lines of Python code. And then their colleague comes in, and they hand over the code to him, and he says, wait, that's made too complicated. I don't understand it. I write it again. And I don't think that's, that's where we should go. And if we care about productivity, and it felt like the NoSQL space does care about productivity, right. then I think we should do something here. I'm, I'm, whether it's a standard or not, but I think the query languages that we have are not good enough. Okay. Now, I, I, I attended your presentation, and I saw that uh, you were doing some pretty complicated queries on multiple different kinds of data sources. And from my memory, it was about 20 lines of code. And from what I seem to remember, if I had to do that in a, a Python language, that would have been two, three hundred lines of code. Is that 
Yeah, I guess if you, really? have, if you have a high-level declarative query language and you're willing to learn from the past and how query languages have been developed, I think you can easily gain one to two orders of magnitude in lines of code, which means fewer bugs, which means less time, better maintenance. Okay. So, so let me now be the devil's advocate. You, you, we, have, we have a potential query language, um, but one of the things we're finding is that although we've solved some of the scalability problems, um, there's a lot of different types of data models that people are using. And let me just say, uh, uh, in the graph space, we have property graphs, and we have RDF. And RDF has a standard, Sparkle, but uh, it seems like a lot of people that are doing property graphs can't, or, or uh, that, that language is, not, it doesn't work for them. Uh, they want to be able to do something else. Um, any, you guys want to comment on that? Uh, Obviously, Sparkle isn't taking over the world. It was a lot, people worked very hard for it, on it, uh, and it has solved some problems. But, uh, for example, Neo4j doesn't work out of the box with Sparkle. If, if you prefer to work in Sparkle, you can drop the Sparkle library on top of Neo4j and pretend it's a triple store. Absolutely. So it's your choice, right? We're not um, dogmatic. You can drop uh, Sparkle on top of Neo. You can bind to it in a low-level Java API and write hundreds of lines of statically typed code. You can drop Gremlin on top of Neo if you fancy doing imperative path-based programming, or you can do declarative programming, declarative pattern matching programming with Cypher. But on a personal note, um, I find triples quite difficult to work with as a mental model. I don't find them to be very rich. I don't find them to be uh, intellectually comparable to the ease of use that a property graph has. And therefore, that's why I find myself wanting to explore a graph as a graph, not as a disconnected set of triples, and certainly not as something that I inference through Sparkle. Your mileage may vary. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. Um, we prefer people to import the RDF and then use our native uh, interface. Um, whether I'm talking okay. infinite graph, the graph database, or uh, objectivity, um, you know, we can get it C++ and so on as well. Uh, OQL um, had some elements of graph in it, but not enough. Um, and you know, right now, if you're going to say, is there a really good single-purpose graph language out there? No. Uh, you're definitely okay with Spark with, with RDF. Um, I, I like Cypher as, as a first attempt at something to handle property graphs. Uh, where somewhere in the middle we, we're still procedural, um, very strongly expressed queries that uh, you can save and rerun. Um, we haven't gone declarative yet, but I don't really want to go declarative unless I go with something that looks like it can make a standard. If we can take Cypher, with the community and move it forward to do the things our customers want to do as well, that's fine by me. So uh, I think we there's something to be done yet. Cypress still evolving. Neo's community is building lots of new stuff. We're building lots of new stuff. Our customers are asking for lots of new stuff. And if you look at how you get things rolling, you can either ignore standards for a while and go your own way and hope you can make it. So you play your own furrow. That works often, but not very often. Uh, or you can modify an existing one. Never the best choice, but we've got lots of grounding. Sparkle's not a good place to start. OQL might be better. Cypher is probably the best for us. Uh, it should be fairly easy to embrace um, what Sparkle does with Cypher. Uh, or you can um, just forget the standards thing and then you end up in chaos. And uh, basically, uh, I've seen at least three different database technologies over the years fail to make it to mainstream mm -hmm. because they didn't get the tool vendors building stuff fast yeah. enough. Yeah. So, so let's remember what's at stake so we, here. People that we are going to depend <coughs> on people like this. Yeah, yeah. Well. So how many people here have heard of OQL? OK, a couple people. All right. Um, so OQL is the object query language, and it was an attempt by the people building object-oriented databases, uh, Versant and Gemstone and some of the uh, very early pioneers in hierarchical uh, object stores uh, to create a standard language. Um, but I don't think it re the vendors really embraced it. We, um, you know, we all looked at it. Uh, at least one did. Poet started building stuff. Right, Poet was doing um, that. I, I was instrumental in saying, we're not going to build that. We want the tool vendors to do it. Then we couldn't find the tool vendors. And then we found PowerSoft, which people remember built Power Builder. That was really the, the right. force in right. the yes. SQL world at the time. Yeah. They committed to building an OQL 
tool, which was wonderful. And then Sybase bought them, and that was over. <laughs> so we had about three months to our second release, which introduced new languages. Okay. Know, and uh, so we took SQL and modified it. We bought an SQL engine, put an object-oriented extensions in it, called it SQL++. We still use it today for QA. And, um, and there are tools that can use it, because any ODBC tool can use it, but mm -hmm. it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so the lesson here for, for me is, so I was doing development with Java and uh, actually uh, Smalltalk, I should say, and, and Versant quite a while ago. And one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to build products. Mm -hmm. But I did not want to lock myself into a single vendor. So I was saying, we're going to wait to see how these OQL standards, and we went off and did other business plans. So my, one of my questions is, how many people are there out there that would like to build really cool applications, and they're just sitting on the sidelines, waiting for standards to shake out in the NoSQL world, and as soon as these standards become viable, we're going to see not just a 10%, but a, a three-fold increase, or a three orders of magnitude increase in the number of people using this to solve business problems because we've wrapped them in solutions. And then they just disappear in the background. So, ask the audience. Yeah, so how, how many people here, uh, if you were software developers uh, building applications, would think about more, more aggressively about building a NoSQL solution uh, if you had one query language that ran on every product here? Okay? <laughs> wow. Okay, I, I, think, I think we have a couple business plans that are sitting on the shelf uh, if we could do this, if we could figure out a way to do this. So the, that's one of the problems with standards, though, is who's going to pay to have the standards developed? Because standards take a long time. Yeah. I, I mean, I've been on the W3C X query working group. And each of the, the standards, each of the new revisions of the query language takes a couple of years. And I've been in those uh, working groups every week talking about the things. And it takes a long time. On the other hand, there are a lot of tough problems, and standardizing it and coming up with the right semantics is a tough job. Right. And I think that's what the NoSQL community at the moment doesn't see. Each vendor uh, comes up with a quick query language. Every week, they add another new feature. They can do smarter than in one week, then they can do a greater than comparison the next week. And they invent query technologies as they go. And I think that is not looking enough into the past and what has been developed, being developed there. So I, yeah, I was talking to one of the VPs of one of the uh, database data store vendors. And they said, yeah, we don't care about query technologies. So that's, it. we need to solve a couple of other problems. The query language later on, that will be easy. It's just in grammar and you're done. <laughs> and uh, this I couldn't disagree more with. So I think, uh, yeah, a good query language, a good declarative query language is very hard to do. We need to learn from the past. And whether it's being a standard or not, that's, that's a different thing. Um, I'd like to invite anybody that has questions. Uh, raise your hand. Uh, and we, you can ask individuals, or we can uh, uh, all attempt to, to answer the questions. Um, I, I do have one question that um, is, has been early on my mind about uh, the interfaces between these databases and the query tools. Um, it seems that if you had a single processor and you could uh, count the number of rows and tables and people want to do joins, you can use the statistics on a single processor uh, to optimize your queries. But now that we have these clusters and, uh, and the clients now have to have information about which records are in which nodes of clusters, uh, that maintaining that information in a distributed cluster uh, can be expensive sometimes. Um, so when I do a write to one, I need to update information around that cluster about how that write will have impact on future queries. So, uh, so here's, here's my question is, do you guys think that writing query language for distributed systems uh, is going to have a good trade-off, uh, even though we have more information that we can use? Uh, in these clusters? Um, we, you know, Objectivity has always been a distributed database, and so we've always used federation of databases, which were homogeneous at first, they were just our own. Um, and so we, when you launch a query, what used to happen was 
data was bought to the client and then we comb through it and return what you want. And we changed that four or five years ago with a parallel query engine which distributes fragments of the query out to individual uh, agents, query agents, that um, are little objectivity applications that then go in and find the data. And if the data is in the bit wherever they are, great. If they need to go somewhere else to complete the query, that happens because they're applications and they're in a distributed database environment. So it's actually not hard to make a system work. Now, if you want to use statistics to speed that up, what you're implying there is that you've got optimization going on that can take advantage of it. We don't need that. Um, with, with navigational queries and with object-oriented queries, you, you don't need it because you're not doing any joins. Cardinality doesn't matter. The programmer knows better than to start at the bank and go through all the transactions to find out if this customer is connected with that bank. You wouldn't do that. You'd start from the customer and look at his transactions or her transactions, see if that's connected to the bank. So the, that optimization is done by the program before they start. So um, if you need to optimization, yes, stats are good, but they can be distributed. You know, we do distributed counting when we need to. If you're not doing that, then it, it's, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, I would say one thing, though. Once you start spanning different databases, for federation, the way you are, for instance, then the whole game changes because you're farming out bits of the query and you have no idea how long those other agents are going to take to give information back. And it is as if you did a query on Google and also wanted 12 windows filled by the web servers behind it. You don't know when they're all going to fill out. That's true. Okay, so that's always going to be there. And federation falls down if the thing gets too big. So keep it small, high, you know, low latency network, high bandwidth network, great. Uh, low latency, unreliable. You need to play other tricks. It's clear. I mean, Jim Cray said it. If you want to have fast queries, you need to ship your queries to the data. Yeah. So yeah. There's, there's no way really around that. Mm -hmm. And if you're going higher level federation, then yeah, it's becoming more tricky, and then you need to, to play other tricks and maybe have statistics or cost models for yeah, your you underlying collect, data Collect the statistics, exactly. Yes. Yeah, the higher level, collect them at a higher level, use them to, to help farm stuff out. So now, we have a placement manager that allows you to say, you know, put stuff over in that country database, that country database. So we're not going to go, if you go looking for something in Europe, we're not going to go look at in any Asian database, because we know 20, it's only going to be over there. Uh, so the more clues you can give the query manager in terms of placement and so on, the better it is. It's particularly hard in large homogeneous graphs. You know, if every node is of the same type and every connection is the same type, that's your worst nightmare. And because uh, that can get really bad when you try to do uh, some algorithms like working out uh, you know, maximum span and things that have to be done um, across the whole graph. That's some appalling domain modeling if you've got homogeneous graph. Yeah, only, yeah, only yeah. mathematicians have <laughs> homogeneous exactly, graphs. Exactly, we yeah. have actual graphs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank <laughs> if, if you've got that, you've got a university yeah, professor that's thank, trying to model some discrete yeah, maths. Thank, thank goodness. The more, <laughs> the more heterogeneity there is, the more oh, optic yeah. classes, the more types of edge, the more types of the, the happier we are. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're skewed here, right? So this, this, yeah. is, this is an incredibly skewed panel because yeah, you've got two graph databases and a query dude. So we are not at all representative of the big plethora of NoSQL, no. right? Which actually encompasses a range of different well, he does, he does data models. He does two types. He does represent two types. Yeah, <laughs> but there's a bit, so there's at least four that I could like spit out yeah. before we even get into like splitting right. out, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, what we have, what, 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 what we have as an advantage as graph databases if we, is we have relationships. Yeah. So if you give me a declarative query, a, a bunch of metadata about the kind of patterns you're looking for, I'm going to use those relationships to my advantage. I'm going to use locality at write time. I'm going to use caching at read time. I'm going to use the structure of the data at runtime to optimize that query, which means actually we get a head start in terms of query optimization because there's a bunch of metadata that you guys, as, as users of graph database, put into our databases called relationships or edges or whatever you want to call them and they give us such a head start in, in optimizing queries. Where I think the bigger challenge is, is if you've got one of the aggregate data stores, column family store, key value store, document store, and they don't have any linkage, or at least formal, they haven't formalized any linkage between records. And I think their query optimization is pretty difficult. That's correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, yeah, it sums up nicely. Okay, so, so your, your basic thesis is if you start with a graph model, there's enough hints there that you can get 
relatively fast queries, even on distributed platforms. Yes. If, if it's properly and, formulated, and, um, and, and actually the more variety you get, the happier you are. Okay. You know, so flexible schema is our friend, because we don't care. The more, the merrier. But, but if you have homogeneous data, uh, tabular or document uh, type data, um, you, you, you need to gather a statistical and cost-based models uh, yeah, and then yeah. use those to optimize your queries. Yeah, yeah, even without a join, yeah. you, you need to figure out which index you're going to leverage mm -hmm. in, your, in your query. And if you have a bunch of indexes and you don't know about the selectivity of, of those predicates that you use, then you don't know which index you're going to use. So, so there, there you have to have that information to do the optimization. Mm -hmm. And so the, people are not doing that, have, uh, do not have that today. And a lot of uh, relational databases don't, ha don't have a cost-based optimizer. Most of them are still uh, implementing heuristics, and there's still research going on in those fields. So I don't expect that the NoSQL community will next year have an, a cost-based optimizer with perfect statistics. Um, but still, there's something to learn from it. You should clone our code sometime next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the other thing that occurs to me always you know, when talking about query languages, look, someone invents a new one every week and it's getting very tiresome. Mm -hmm. um, someone invents a new file structure every day, that's yeah, even worse. Uh, there are only really four ways to get at data, okay? Let's not forget that. There are only four. And I'm not going to tell you what the fourth one is. Um, <laughs> so if we build something that can get at it, it's not to do with the four varieties of NoSQL database we're seeing. This is real primitive storage engine right down there at the disk head stuff. Uh, there's only four ways, so if we cope with that and then refine it upwards, we should be able to build something that embraces all these models. And what we need is someone with the mathematical brain and time and simplicity that, say, Codball with relational algebra, just look at it again and come out with a model. There are, there are some guys in Poland who've had a good crack at it, but not close enough. Some guys um, in University of Texas had a crack at it, not quite enough. It is doable, and if we do it at that level and have a kernel for a query language, you know, like you build toolkits for other things, maybe we can build a stack above it that's better. And um, I just wish I, I had time, I don't. I, I would like to just get out of there. So, so what you're saying is that, just like we're looking for the grand unified field theory yes. of all physics, yes. you're looking for the unified query language for all these different types yeah, of data. I'm, I'm saying let's start with the atoms, if you like, or the quarks. Let's start with the quarks and, and deal with that, and then come above it. Rather than coming from the top down, which is often a nice way to look at it and abstract it, I don't think we need to go that way. I think we need to look at the primitives, get that right, and then the rest of us can build things around it, which at the top level look to the user as if it's a standard, uniform, whatever. But what's going on underneath the covers is completely different for each of the different uh, engines underneath. Okay. Yeah, that would be the, uh, the ideal. I, I'm asking for unicorns. That would be close to what I'd ask for. Maybe I'll The OMG you. endorse your unicorns, then I notice. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm actually, I might spend some time. I'm, I'm due for a six-month sabbatical. It's due in 1988 or 89, I think, so I'm going to take <laughs> <laughs> Any time now. Any more questions from the audience here? Don't be shy. I, I have a question, if you don't mind. Sure. And that is, um, you know, how many different query languages have you used over your lifetime? Think about it for a moment. You know, is it one to 10? Anyone only, anyone use, right, anyone only used SQL? Is there any, anyone here who's only ever used SQL? Now, five? Anyone use less than five? Oh, good, good. That's 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 probably, must be very young. Um, <laughs> but that, that's actually <laughs> tremendously unlikely, considering yeah. a lot of web pages you go to are formulating their own informal query languages. Well, yeah, and you, there's and that you as type well. Them in, so, yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's it's horrible. There's there's dozens and dozens, mm -hmm. and there's flavor of the month, you know. And if, you know, for property things, if Cypress flavor of the month, and we jump on it. You can bet your life that two years from now, something else is going to be out there. Oh, but it'll still have a terrible name. <laughs> uh, I think I think I saw a presentation call it o uh, just a bit ago uh, where people were using the Lucene query language for doing full text, uh, you know, uh, with proximity searches mm -hmm. and things like that. So it, it seems like there are many different variations of these things. Yeah, and you get variations of variations. That's you know, what's what's weird. 
I, I do sometimes wonder that. I, I, I really do. I, I, I grew up in a very highly visual world, and um, you know, where you point and click on things. You see the picture, you rotate it, and bang, and you look for some more, and draw some more, and so on. And so I've never actually been a very strong fan of queries. Uh, Objectivity DB at release one had no query language. Probably the first database ever released as a commercial product with no query language whatsoever. It was you went in with a key value and you navigated through the associations. People built solid models, people built whole products based on it. And everything they did was highly visual. They, they never used a query language. Now later, you know, we got into the intelligence community, they really do worry about locality and where people are and you know, other stuff, how tall they are and how many legs they've got. Um, and then you start to want to do it. But you can do all that with query by example. So you put the right pictures on the screen, you actually don't need a query language. You let people refine stuff. So I don't know. So maybe we're looking for the holy grail. That's pretty fascinating, right? Because Cypher is pictorial. Yes. Admittedly, it's ASCII art pictorial, it's ASCII art. but it's yes. pictorial. Yeah, that's kind of yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we learn all so much from visual analytics that you don't have to express it declaratively. <coughs> Sometimes it's a lot better to get hold of it and grab it. I mean, any of you ever, you ever tried to catch a, a, a small pig? <laughs> a greased pig? <laughs> well, I am surprised. Really, no hands. Because like, we do that all the time in London. Like, oh, pig, yes. marvellous. Yes, yes. I, I, I grew up on a farm, you see, so take, take the grandkids to a farm and you let them loose and say, go catch a pig each. It is really funny. I mean, it is really it funny. It happens in the West Country. <laughs> but, but you see, you I live in a city, by the way. Do not tar us with the same brush. Yeah, I know right. we have it's the same like, dodgy accent, it, though. It does, not, it, does, it does not work. It does not work. Same as flying a plane. But now you can almost do a plane. It does not work to type the query in and expect the right pigs to come to you. Okay, it doesn't happen now. <laughs> so I think you really want the slow ones, though. Uh, uh, but they don't taste good. I think the, and people don't love to take a look at it because for, for whatever reason, but I think it's worth it to look at XQuery, which has a history in OQL, which has a history in SQL, mm -hmm. and uh, we've extended XQuery with, with JSON support, and I think it is a nice declarative model. It has a, an, an algebra behind it. A lot of people have spent time to develop an algebra to evaluate uh, XQuery, so I guess that also might address your concerns. It has an extension for full text search yes. that allows people right. to do more right. than the, the Lucene full text query. Does it's really declaratively you can describe contains text uh, within distance of four words. So I think it is a very nice extension that allows you to declaratively do full text search. It has an update specification that I think mm -hmm. is nice. It has declarative updates, which I think. Uh, a language, not only a query language, but an extension of it should have. Right, Sparkle l l didn't have that in their mm -hmm. first version, so. And yeah. so people don't like xQuery. I've, I've learned that yeah. for whatever reason, because it has the x word. Um, but so what we did is we removed all the angle brackets from xQuery and put uh, the curly brackets from JSON in. And if you're really looking at it, it's, it's the same thing. And the concepts out there, people love them. And it allows them to do the complex queries that they need to do. Um, query by example might, it, yeah, it solves some problems and it's easy to get started with, but then you still want to do more complex queries. And um, yeah, I encourage people to take a look at JSONic. It's an open specification, it's not a standard or anything. Anybody can contribute to it at the moment. And it's a very high level declarative language that allows you to do a lot of complex stuff. So can I, you extend I, it? Sorry, can you extend it to do what Cypher does? And vice versa, I can see it being much easier to take Cypher and embrace JSON or whatever than the other way right now. But I need to. I, I, think, I think you can go ahead. Can I express eigenvector centrality? Exactly. Yes. I think you can extend it. Yes. It doesn't have the support for that yet, but well, I don't I, think it's hard to. It's worth a try. I know there there has been uh, an effort to extend XQuery uh, with Sparkle. So X Sparkle. Uh, Stop it! Someone's yeah, killing kittens right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. That, that was actually done on your side you're, of the pond, wasn't it? You're a monster. Deary. No, really? <laughs> oh, crap. Uh, See, your tax dollars just paid for phone call snooping. Mine pays for, like, killing kittens. Grace. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that too soon? Can I not make jokes no, about no. that yet? No, it's, it's like, uh, you know... Ring, ring. Hello, NSA. Uh, what, was that, what was that? It's like taking an Edsel and, you know, trying to <laughs> and turn it into a pink candle. I don't know. 
I, I, I want to just uh, mention the fact that I, I use XQuery uh, quite a bit. And uh, for me, um, it was uh, an, an ability to actually completely eliminate a middle tier of software hmm. that okay. really uh, yes. uh, gravitates me. I mean, with SQL, you can't return a web page. With all of my XQuery code, I, I can eliminate an entire middle tier of software. And I can do my queries and build a web page directly. Um, it's a functional programming language, so I can use all the, the function reuse. I have extension extensibility. Uh, I have a huge number of uh, XQuery libraries uh, that I have at my fingertips. Um, I can do FTP in the middle of an XQuery. I can do cryptography. Uh, there's a new EXPath function for doing bit, bit operations with EXPath. So, it seems like um, my productivity when I use XQuery uh, goes up dramatically, especially since um, the people doing the queries can actually build the structures, uh, and then the only thing we do is style the page with CSS. Absolutely. Right? And, and that's a separation of concerns I don't, sure. I don't know. Yeah. You, you can do that, and we, we try to, to sell this, and our product actually can do this. But people, so people love their middleware. So don't tell them that they can just remove it because then they're not going to buy your product. So if you sell it as a query language, then people will discover themselves that they can do it. And probably that's what you did, what you did as well. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to love it. But that's just the experience. Uh, I've got we, to say, Cypher have. cannot do FTP. And it's highly unlikely we will ever allow it to do FTP. So because that's a separation of concerns I think I'd like to maintain. <laughs> so clearly, I mean, the. It, if you want to have a query language, and it's a pure query language, it's not going to be non-deterministic and not have side effects. Mm -hmm. And if you're having FTP, you either, if you read, you have a non-deterministic query language, or you are going to have side effects if you push that. So without those extensions, FTP is, is not a, a good thing to have. And if you want to have extensions and do more of that kind of stuff, then you need to extend your query language with uh, such concepts. But then you don't have the optimizability and stuff that you want to do. Uh -oh. Quick, someone say something. It's gone deadly quiet. <laughs> oh. We have a question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there is like an immense gushing over here now. Yes. Yeah, a little bit, particularly at the National Visual Analytics Consortium. And those guys, uh, Pat Hadden and group at Stanford, uh, came out of that as the RBAC, the Regional Visual Analytics Consortium representative. Um, so yes, we you know, quite a lot of looking around there. No really staggering results. Um, and I think part of it is that you, you need to talk to the end users. Um, and they weren't doing quite enough of it, even though they had access to CIA and SA, all these guys. Um, they really weren't listening hard to the analysts. Um, so what they've got at the moment is reasonable for business problems and some scientific problems. Um, but if, if you talk to the average guy from the intelligence community and ask him to describe you know, his everyday query, uh, an hour later, your, you know, your, your head's singeing and your ears are ringing, and you realize that it's not an easy thing, and the the more you uh, the more you learn about complex queries and particularly um, visual analytics, you more you find out that actually the query it doesn't really matter um, how you express it as long as you can bring the bits together. Uh, that's why I'm all for building from the bottom up rather than the top down. Uh, if we can give them the, the building blocks, a lot of these people can put the rest of it together themselves. So I, I think that's a good one. I, I think there, there are excellent examples in the CAD CAM world. Okay, they are the most skilled um, query people in the world. They can drill right down inside a 747 and walk around it 
without writing a line of code or, or a single query or typing anything. So there's a lot to learn on that side. So but the, if we want to do it machine, sorry, if we want the machines to do it, that's different because they haven't got the eyes and the hands to do it. So you, what you end up with wanting something that you can execute and re-execute. And, and I'm, I'm close to the cipher than this. I think you can see that I am to trying to modify an existing language. You said the people in the CAD CAM world. Yeah, the CAD CAM, yes. Uh, originally, they were using things like OQL, object query language, to store their, mm -hmm. their objects. Yeah, still a lot of people doing it. Yeah, a lot, a lot of things. Like, you know, Hong Kong Airport was built using, uh, you know, using our system inside a, a system that used to construct it and all the rest of it, plan, build, execute, 777, 787. Uh, all those things are objects. They're all visual. You can walk... You could walk around inside them and construct them before any any metal was touched or any composite. Uh, so they and they, but again, they they've got a very specific role, and then they want to run algorithms which don't rely on the queries. The algorithms they then run are, you know, working out the electrical connection between chips and what's happening when you flip this or flip that, or what happens if I push this. Uh, it's quite different from looking at data mining in a big data warehouse. Mm -hmm. It is is very different. But they've got the techniques. What we don't have at the moment is taking your various big data stores, hitting it with a few simple commands, and putting something up there that you can then say, OK, I want to go here, I want to go there. That's what, that's what we're missing. We're missing a big chunk of the puzzle. So what I agree with you, at least with one thing, which is we need to talk to the people who use it. Mm -hmm. And the people who use it are not only developers. They are Ab absolutely, absolutely. Right. Yes, right. end user. End it's user, end user. It's analysts that would usually use Excel for for doing something, and I think we need to give those people a language that they can use, mm -hmm. and that they can understand. And the NoSQL data stores are far away from that. That's a very sweeping statement. <laughs> I mean, like um, I have a guy who's on my sales team, and he's a he's a Belgian guy, and he has a he has a penchant for Belgian beers, mm -hmm. and he's not extremely technical. But he can use the Cypher query language to manage his beer collection. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm, okay. Actually, he's brilliant, right? Go to his house, tell him your preferences. He'll run a Cypher query, then he'll disappear down the cellar. No, it's not an Austrian cellar, it's just a Belgian cellar, they're safer. Um, and he'll come back with the right beer for you, like, based on not only the kind of beer preferences, but the brewer and his father and his father's. But anyway. I encourage you. No, to I agree with you that Cypher yeah. is going into the right direction because. Yeah. So yeah. But it's, but it's, yeah. It's, I, I think it's becoming accessible now to. I, I, don't, I think the idea of like you know my grandmother using a query language is kind of a bit <laughs> unicorny. No. Um, but I still think you have to have some technical for us to be able to grasp even a humane query language. Yeah. I think yeah. we shouldn't set expectations too high that it will be accessible to the no. CEO. Right, because that guy's always a bozo, right? right. And he's, oh shit, we're being filmed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought my boss isn't here, I'm safe no. to say this. Uh, okay, anyway. Sweet, no, I, right. I agree with you. No, he so doesn't what, what, Mateo. Right, no, oh, yeah, what, true. what we do is we, we're talking to some um, guys in the financial industry. One of the guys is one of the inventors of XBRL, which is a data format to transfer and exchange financial information. It's going to be mandated by the SEC next year. He's a relatively technical guy, but the, and he was trying to apply NoSQL technologies to his uh, business needs, and he couldn't do it. And so, yeah, I think we're still far away from that. You see, now, I'm, I'm looking the other way. I'm looking at my phone because I have Graph My Life, which is a, an app built on Infinite Graph that we just use as a demonstrator, and I can poke on a few icons here, and I can find some photos, and I can find out who created those photos, and I can find out whether any of those photos were taken by people who are in my social network, some of whom are here. And I can do that without writing any query at all. I'm just, just poking buttons. Yeah, but the SEC query. filings are not a you're, social you're network. You're building a query through the graphical interface yes. by adding constraints. Yeah. That's right. So, so I, I, I have a, a subset of maybe a full query language, but uh, a rules engine. So I work a lot in the federal space. Uh, we have a lot of XML data. Um, we found that we can teach people how to write business rules, uh, schematron and type things, by teaching them path expressions and we give them a graphical tool where they can click over a, a thing, extract a path and put it in a business rule. So they don't need any Java, they don't need to know object allocation and memory and things, but they do need about a, a week of training 
and they can build and maintain business rules. Um, and that's, those are the kinds of mini query languages. I wouldn't say XPath is a full query language, but it certainly is powerful uh, if you need to do complicated things. But then we can also build business rules. And not having path expressions in JSON uh, seems to be difficult sometimes. So I, I always keep saying I want to have simplicity. I want to have the simplest structures, but I also want to have path languages. Yeah, I agree with you. Question here. You know, that, that's, that's okay from that perspective, and I'm with you on, in that perspective. However, as um, a company trying to build software and deliver it, we have to worry about QA and quality. Uh, you know, we, we support um, about a dozen different platforms in 32 and 64-bit, you know, uh, was it six, seven, eight, you know, yeah, more than a dozen operating systems, uh, eight languages, blah, blah, blah. Now you give me another language, uh, our QA people can ask for a lot of resource, um, because we've got to test everything multi-way. Now, if you say, okay, do it in the open community. I had this discussion with Larry Ellison on a panel once. And he said, oh, it's easy, you know, heterogeneity is no problem. You just write a converter from X to Y, you know, it's just like that. So I said, okay, 400 converters, who's going to write them? You're going to write them, am I going to write them? Is the audience going to write them? Can we depend on the community to make sure that everything works in every direction? You know, and it can't. You can't. So, so we, you know, proliferation is great. Innovation is great, but, but narrowing it down to something that we can all get behind is what made SQL run. It's why 20, 30 years on, we're still using SQL for building very big systems. Sure, as the ISIN standardization of SQL happened in a different time, ah. three decades ago, software was developed in a different way, mm -hmm. a very engineering-based mm -hmm. approach. That's a very good point. You know, uh, when we talked about standards and doing it, you know, in the old days, if some standard had to be coped with, you know, X25, OSI, whatever it was, you took the person who was least valuable on the team that you wanted to fire but couldn't, and you sent them on the standards team. Right? That's, the way it was. <laughs> That's what you did. You, you, you sent them off and you gave them an expense account. You said, you know, don't spend more than this, and see you when you see you. See you at Christmas, maybe. That's what you did. I mean, honestly, that's what you did. Now it's completely different. We go out to the community, you know, 5,000 people get in there, come form a little club, you know, these guys know how it works, my sequel knows how it works. And you can make things happen very fast, and you can find ideas, and you can try things, and throw stuff away. So when I think of a standard today, I don't think of that old environment. I think of something highly dynamic that moves, that we can get behind. And, you know, I don't mind trying to stand on top of a snowball, okay? I'm prepared to try it. I don't care and a snowball morphs into something else, I don't care either. As long as I got something to ride to get me from here to there, and my users jump on there with me, my, my customers, I'm going to be happy, right? I, but I need something. I can't, I can't say, well, mm, yeah, Cypher's great, but we haven't got it yet, and we don't know what they're going to do next week. You know, or, yeah, I'd like to go see these guys, they're federating everything, but forget the performance or whatever, if that happens, that's the worst that can happen. Uh, I think we've got to do something for ourselves. And the community will clearly drive it. 
And yeah. if you have enough uh, adoption, it's a de facto standard. So mm -hmm. you, you solve that problem. So, so that's, a, that's a key thing. Um, if, if JSONic worked on two or three of the major players, there'd start to be a base of software developers that would start to use it. Wouldn't that pressure the other people to come into line? That is, we just need this, this critical mass before we have pressures of software developers getting the rest of the people to adapt it? I guess that's true, yeah. So, so there are, are ways where you can reach a threshold. And, and maybe the same is true for Cypher. Yeah. Uh, if you had uh, a few software packages that start to depend on Cypher, then the other graph databases would have to support it. Yeah. But you yeah. don't convince people on a horizontal query language. You need to, and that's getting back to giving people something that they can use, you need to pe convince people in verticals that this query language solves their problem, that they can use it to solve their problems. And if you do this, then you get a, enough ad adoption, and then you get into what you call standardization or de facto standardization. Yeah, I, uh, again, if our users could use Cypher, they'd be using it. So, and unfortunately, rather than being open, these are people who live in dark glass boxes that you can't see in underground. And we've got to get them in here somehow. If we can just get their ideas out Dude, here. I have Swedes. Their whole country is nighttime. <laughs> Always. I know, I know. But it's compatible yes. with your spooks. Ah, but you can ask them questions. Uh, well, they are, yeah, well, I'm not sure you ever get a straight answer. You get no. an answer like from no. the killing. No, but they do have good fish. So, um, but that's, that's the problem. We can get those people to say, look, you know, you've got to be able to do this. If we can then get the Cypher community to jump up and say, all right, you know, like this, let's do it. We're all for that. We'll join in. We're more than happy to join in. But then, those guys are not interested in JSON or other things. So we've still got, yeah, yeah. At, the, at the NoSQL level, we've still got the same issue. And that's why I always say, you know, ground up, not top down. We all agree? Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> I can't agree. So the only question is who's going to do it? <laughs> We've got to find something to disagree on so you can keep Emil happy. Um. <laughs> Sorry, that's an in joke, but Emil always likes the, the uh, panel not to agree with each other. So. Okay. Uh, well, well, I disagree that we've run over time because yes, I need to catch I a flight see, home. See. Yes, right. Right. Okay, I think I, with that, I think guess we'll wrap it up here. So Thanks. I just want to thank our panelists. Please give them a big round of applause. Thanks.